Orphan Boy masters parry skill and now has the most powerful magic. If you dig my recaps, don't forget to subscribe and smash that notification bell. On a cloudy night, a man named Noor unblocked the neighborhood's water supply with a shovel. The next morning after the hard work Aunt Stella gave him his well-deserved payment. Another day during intense construction work Noor was the most determined of all the workers carrying dozens of sandbags at once. At the end of his shift as he received his daily wage he heard a girl crying for help in the distance. Without hesitation he ran to the cave from where the sound came and found himself face to face with a hideous creature being fought by several soldiers. Fifteen years ago to the northwest of the Kingdom of Clay's young Nor stacked firewood to feed the fire that warmed the humble farm where he lived. Despite his youth circumstances had forced him to act like an adult from an early age, as his mother depended on him due to her illness. After giving her an herbal medication he informed her that he needed to take the goats to the hill. His mother looked at him with a worried expression but he promised not to go past the rock they had agreed upon. To reassure her he promised to bring back a rabbit and some herbs for soup, though she didn't seem to improve despite all his efforts. Seeing his mother cough, Nor ran to fetch water, but she pulled him back, wiped a smudge from his face, and lamented from the depths of her heart that she couldn't be there for him in life's moment. Her wish was that he could live the life he wanted. Keeping his promise, Nor prepared the soup and informed his mother that it was ready. However, when he brought her a bowl, he realized the worst had happened. At dawn, the boy buried his mother in the backyard next to another grave he had made with some stacked stones and flowers. Tears streamed down his face as he lost someone so important, but the determination of this child was beyond imaginable. After wiping his face Nor continued with his life as it had always been. Working in the field and his usual hunting provided his food and kept him sane in the terrible conditions he faced, but he managed to cope through dedication and hard work. Contrary to what one might expect from a boy his age, he even found time for studies amidst all the physical labor he was required to do every single day. During dinner, he looked at the other side of the table and saw no one there. To keep from getting discouraged, he focused on his bowl of food. One night after a fall while reaching for a specific book, he wanted Nor began to flip through its pages and a memory instantly came to his mind. A few years ago, his father had told him a bedtime story about an adventurer who defeated a giant dragon with the help of his friend's learned magic from an ancient sorcerer broke the curse of a forest and was rewarded with an elixir that cures everything from the king of death. According to his father, no matter the difficulty level an adventurer would always raise his sword against evil and injustice. Hearing this story made young Nor's eyes sparkle. Now, with the adventurer's tale in his hands, he recalled his mother's words about living the life he desired. At dawn he placed fresh flowers on his parents' graves and announced that he was leaving the city for the first time in his life to become an adventurer. Without much ado he bid farewell and set out on a journey that would change his life forever. A little further on he saw two blocks made of a strange material in his path but decided to pass through without thinking much of it. As he crossed the blocks he unknowingly stepped through a magical line. When night fell he camped somewhere in the forest and felt fear from the nocturnal sounds made by the animals but he maintained his composure to prove to himself that he could handle it. After resting and continuing on his way he saw the big city in the distance and was stunned by its magnitude. Gaining access to the inside of the walls he wandered through the market always wide-eyed and with a smile on his face. Following his path to his destination he finally found the adventurer's guild. However the receptionist dampened the boy's enthusiasm by saying that it wasn't a place for children. Moreover he reminded Nor that his parents would worry about him. Without hesitation Nor said they were both dead. This statement caught the receptionist's attention who then tried to help by saying that younger ones should go through the royal training school school before coming to the guild. A few months later eager to be one of them the boy started practicing alongside other students. Some could conjure magic on their wooden swords and Nor tried hard to do the same but his teacher didn't seem very confident in the novice's abilities. After all the only skill Nor had managed to learn so far was parry which involves defending against an attack in a way that allows a counterattack. For this reason the tutor advised him to seek another path in life. Despite this without losing enthusiasm young Nor knocked on the royal army's door and began intense training to become a knight. After more months of practice, the novice instructor delivered the sad news that Nor had developed well below expectations and continuing this training could jeopardize his physical integrity. Being rejected again, he sought to become a hunter, but the teacher said he had no talent with a bow. Then 
then he turned to professional thieves, but the local tutor noted that he wasn't capable of disarming traps or perceiving the presence of enemies around him. When he tried to become a mage, the master sorcerer made it clear that Nor could only manage to be a human lighter by conjuring a useless spark. Losing his determination, Nor's brightness dimmed as he was dismissed from the church for not being an effective healer. After a series of failures, he returned to the guild, surprising the receptionist by not being accepted into any existing school in the kingdom. Because of this, he received the worst news Nor could expect. Unfortunately, he wasn't fit to become an adventurer. Head hung low, he leaves the big city certain that he is no prodigy. Upon returning home, he visits his parents' graves, coming to terms with the fact that he lacks the talent for what he most desired in life. However true to his personality, he promises himself that he will train even harder. Reigniting his spirit, he crafts a wooden sword and recalls his teacher's lessons. If you practice a movement repeatedly, you can master it. With this in mind, he trains the only skill he developed during those months away from home, the classic parry. Repeating the gesture non-stop, he spends days and nights honing his skill alone until a year passes and he can already evade ten swords at once. Three years later, Nor could deflect a hundred swords simultaneously. Rain or shine there, he was practicing the same move. One night during training, he feels a strange aura emanating from his hand, which drives him to train even harder. Fourteen years on Nor can deflect a thousand wooden swords, yet he knows no other skills, and the maturity that comes with age makes this fact weigh more heavily on him. Regardless, one ordinary morning, he visits his parents' graves and announces that this is his last attempt to live his dream. Arriving at the Adventurer's Guild, the new receptionist looks over his record and learned skills recommending the beginner's school once again. This time, Nor wants to skip it, but the girl can't register him with such a meager resume. Suddenly, the old guild master reappears, and Nor greets the man though he doesn't remember who this young man is. After a sharper look, the master realizes it's Nor in the flesh, and the two sit down for a drink and chat about life. Nor explains he spent all this time training alone, but could only develop the parry. In response, the master explains there's a rank below E, which is rank F, where Nor can attempt to get a spot, but with conditions. Adventurers of this class can't take missions involving killing or venture outside the city to collect items. In essence, only simple nearby tasks for low-pay jobs that local beggars usually did to secure their daily meal. Despite this, without hesitation, Nor accepts the challenge surprising the guild master. Thus began the days of the new rank F adventurer filled with hard work wherever he went. The tasks he undertook were done with the determination he always showed in life's chores. Whether carrying junk or rescuing a cat, there was Nor fulfilling his objective while continuing to train intensely to advance in life. To his joy, this work time brought him some new skills albeit not very strong ones like feather step or rock throw. Rank F or not Nor had his adventurer's license in hand and that meant he was living his dream, even if just nibbling at the edges. In his mind, it was more than he could ask for. Returning to the day, he encountered the monstrous bull, a creature he never thought he'd see outside the books he read before bed the soldier's commander was giving orders to flank the powerful opponent. Their goal was to protect the girl who was trapped, and the officer managed to accomplish this, even at the cost of his life. With a single blow that minotaur-like beast had crushed the man by hurling him into the wall. Nor tries to help the commander, but his life had already slipped away. Leaderless facing the monster, the soldiers attack recklessly, and they are mercilessly slaughtered one by one. As a result, the path to the girl is left open for the beast. Nor tries to protect her with rock throw. The stone thrown at the minotaur's eye enrages it, and it turns on the human to exact revenge. Running from the opponent as best he can Nor knows he must use the only skill that can make any difference in this battle. Waiting for the right moment, he anticipates the bull's horn attack and uses parry to deflect the blow. Successfully, he sends the enemy crashing into the wall, but it returns with even more fury. Nor continues using the same technique while his sword gradually breaks under the strain. Though he finds openings for a counterattack, he has no offensive skills keeping him on the defensive. Worse still, the Minotaur resumes its attack on the girl, so Nor uses his feather step and strikes as best he can with his sword, which breaks completely in the move. Even if he never becomes a great adventurer, the boy at least wants to protect this defenseless girl before him. After all, as his father said, an adventurer is one who raises his sword against evil. Nor's strike has no significant effect, and he is attacked again. Even with his broken sword, he continues to defend with parry. To his surprise, one of his defenses sends
sends the beast's axe flying back and beheads it. After being saved the girl asks for the adventurer's name, but as he is no one important nor leaves without answering. More soldiers arrive to rescue Lady Lindbergh. Following this victory walking through the city nor realizes that a creature not even a demon can pose such immense danger. Therefore he decides he needs to train even more. The day after the bloody battle soldiers gathered the bodies of those who lost their lives in the name of Lady Lindbergh who paid her respects with a prayer. At that moment Inez the girl's bodyguard arrived with concern and apologized. However the noblewoman emphasized that it made no sense to ask for an escort on a test mission for the heir to the throne. Moreover she herself had insisted on having no bodyguards. Following this Lord Darkin requested that the noblewoman return to the castle immediately because Lord Rain wished to speak with her. At the castle after speaking with Lindbergh the Lord deduced that a minotaur a demon from the depths of the abyss had indeed been in the city. In this case both Rain and Darkin agreed that someone was behind this and Darkin had discovered that the source of the power that brought the monster was a ring found on the corpse of a merchant on the battlefield. Oaken the mage conducted research and found that the magical stone in this accessory was of unparalleled purity, the kind you would never find on the market. Given this rain noted that minotaurs are a level threats, and that not even the wealthy should have the power to purchase something that imprisons such a creature. According to Oaken this ring came from the magical empire of Duridas, which was not surprising considering that this kingdom had a habit of provoking the kingdom of clay. By capturing the princess and summoning an a-level monster simultaneously Lord Rain knew he needed to be cautious about the enemy's next moves. Curiously Duridas had not even tried to erase traces of their involvement raising a question. Regardless it was clear that they wanted the Kingdom of Clay to start a war, as they were eyeing the replicas of the Dungeon of the Lost that resided there. As for the man who saved Lindbergh documents stated that he defeated the Minotaur with a single sword in a matter of seconds. The Espionage Corps followed this individual, but lost sight of him. It was reported that the man vanished before everyone's eyes as if he were an illusion. With that the Lords wondered who this individual was. Back at the Adventurer's Guild Nor surprised the Guild Master by returning alive as news of a demon emerging in the dungeon had spread throughout the village. Since the creature had appeared near the construction site next to the dungeon and Nor had not shown up afterward the Master had been worried. Nor explained that he had been pursued by some strange people the night before so he went straight home and stayed there. The Master asked why Nor's face was so dirty to which he replied that he had spent the morning cleaning mud from the drain before coming. In any case, the master commented that it was fortunate the adventurer had not died as he certainly could not have handled an a-level monster. Nor felt lucky not to have encountered the creature as he had only defeated a cow the previous night and had no major problems. According to the master, the dungeon monster had been killed by a mysterious individual in a matter of seconds making Nor realize there were many strong people around. The master paid the adventurer for his work the previous day until a hooded girl approached from behind and startled him. Revealing her face Lady Lindbergh apologized for the intrusion, but said she needed to find the adventurer using her long-distance detection ability. Surprised Nor asked if she was from the thief class, but she focused on the mage class with knowledge of all six skill systems, though it was so basic that she was embarrassed to discuss it with someone like him. Nor didn't understand why someone would see him that way, and since everyone was looking at the princess, she invited the young man to talk outside the guild. Before leaving the master pulled the boy aside and asked what he had done, but Nor didn't think he had done anything wrong. Continuing the conversation Lindbergh invoked her soundproof barrier to prevent eavesdroppers. Around the city two soldiers were searching for the mysterious man who had defeated the Minotaur but didn't believe they could do better than the Espionage Corps. Nor mentioned that those guys were looking for someone but Lindbergh replied that he didn't need to worry because the two of them couldn't be seen. After reaching a more secluded spot the princess formally thanked the adventurer for his help as he had saved her life. Not only that, but he had also saved countless people who would have been victims of the monster outside the dungeon. Nor thought this was an exaggeration as in his mind, he had only made a small intervention in the fight, but the princess insisted that the adventurer had been decisive. So decisive that she wished to reward him appropriately especially since her father had asked her to find her savior. Despite all her insistence Nor kept saying he didn't need anything from the girl, even though she emphasized that she was a person of status and could provide incredible things for him like land for example. Once again Nor wanted nothing in return leaving Lindbergh speechless. Determined to give something back
back the princess cried and declared she would not leave his side until she gave him what he deserved. This phrase reminded Nor of his childhood when he would knock on the cleric's door and declare he wouldn't leave until he was trained. With that he agreed to meet the girl's father since she insisted so much, but warned he didn't want anything extravagant. Happy Lindbergh used her abilities to conceal them both and begin the journey. Arriving at the clay mansion, Nor couldn't believe that such a large structure was the girl's home as he had never seen anything like it before. By the way the girl asked the adventurer's name and then introduced herself as Lady Lindbergh Clays, but since it was a long name she preferred to be called Lynn. A head in ease received her mistress who asked where her father was. The knight informed her that he was in an audience with Lord Rain and with a stern face asked who the man behind her was. Lynn explained that he was the adventurer who risked his life to save her the previous night while Nor wondered if this woman was some sort of servant but couldn't imagine her doing laundry in all that armor. Besides the woman was clearly keeping an eye on him. On the way Anise was escorting the princess to her father when another knight appeared in front of them pointing his lance at Nora's face who started to fear the craziness of the people in this house. Anise asked Gilbert to calm down because this man was a guest of Lady Lindbergh. Gilbert laughed sarcastically assuming this was the guy everyone was talking about even though he didn't see him as someone special. Anise told him to stop being rude and invited him to join the walk saying the more escorts the better. Meanwhile at the audience with Rain, the king expressed his indignation with Doritas, a kingdom that respected nothing not even the non-aggression pact that had been established. According to Rain, the last meeting with the sovereign of that region had made everything clear. At that time the king of Doritas demanded all rights to explore the dungeon in exchange for the loan of military power. When the proposal was refused the monarch promised that the kingdom of clay would pay. Then Lin arrived greeting her brother and father but as soon as Rain noticed that she was wearing the hermit's cloak he scolded her for leaving the castle again. Lin argued that she had gone in search of the man who saved her life so the king assumed it was the only unknown individual in the throne room. Nor apologized for coming dressed like that and for not knowing how to behave properly but the monarch really didn't care about the adventurer's clothes. On the contrary he showed all his gratitude and stated that it was easier to talk to those who were unaware of aristocratic etiquette rules. Besides if it weren't for the commoner the princess wouldn't be there at that moment. Shaking the king's hand Nor accepted the thanks thinking he could go home now to take a bath. But the king made it clear that letting the young man leave without an appropriate reward would be impossible. Whether it was money or territory the adventurer just had to ask. However Nor replied that he didn't want any of that and surprised by the commoner's reaction. The king mentioned that he had access to the treasures of the oldest dungeon in the world where all kinds of rarities could be found and stored in the treasure room. According to the sovereign Nor could take home half of the stored items. Rain commented that this was madness, but Nor repeated that he wasn't interested in what was offered because a simple thank you was good enough. Thus the monarch tried one last time by pulling out a sword from behind the throne one the size of himself making his son complain again. However the king understood that this weapon had become a mere decorative object so the commoner would make better use of it. Besides no one would notice if he replaced it with the replica he had ordered. Holding the sword Nor felt its weight and imagined it to be something of unimaginable value so he believed he couldn't take it home but the king downplayed the situation saying it was just an item he had found on a journey. With that the adventurer accepted the gift fortified his physique and wielded the sword with impressive ferocity. Even more impressive was the fact that he could hold it with just one hand, a detail the monarch made sure to mention with joy and admiration. Speaking of which regarding his daughter, the king personally asked Nora to teach Lin to be stronger because the outside world was becoming increasingly dangerous and he needed someone trustworthy enough to turn her into a true warrior. Nor argued that he had nothing to teach the girl and that she should choose her tutor herself. The king laughed heartily and agreed with the commoner's view then dismissed him from the meeting. On his way out of the mansion Nor couldn't help but think he was taking home an object of inestimable value even though the king had insisted it was just a piece of charcoal. In any case the boy realized that this weapon had the exact width of Aunt Stella's drain so it would be the perfect shovel for a sensational cleaning. At that moment Inez approached the adventurer and asked for a moment of his time. First of all she apologized for her suspicious attitude towards the one who saved her 
her mistress. Embarrassed by so much formality, Nor asked the woman to stand up, then she emphasized that her duty was to protect the Clay family at all costs, so she wanted the guest to understand the more discerning way in which outsiders were received at the mansion. With that said, she introduced her full name Inese Harness Vice Captain of the Clay family's Choir of Knights. Long ago she was known as the Divine Shield given her efficiency as the princess's bodyguard Lady Lindbergh. To her saving Lynn was the same as saving her own life. Impressed by the woman's titles nor didn't think he had done anything special, but the knight assured him that she would do everything in her power to help the adventurer in any way she could. Seeing that the people of this house didn't accept no as an answer nor saw no other option but to accept this aid. On the other hand Inez emphasized that the way the guest had addressed the king was unacceptable. Therefore if he returned to the throne room he needed to understand that the conduct norms had to be respected. Seeing the boy sweating nervously she asked for his name last and was shocked to learn it was Nor. Without revealing the reason the vice captain said her goodbyes until Gilbert appeared next pointing his lance at the guest's face once more. The lancer invited Nor to test his skills so the poor visitor realized he would never be able to go home again. Arriving in a training room, Gilbert announces that he has brought an adventurer for a simulated battle worrying Nor as he hasn't had a training partner for a long time and doesn't know how to act. Calling Nor Mr. Hero, the Lancer asks the young man to choose any weapon he likes, so with a wooden sword the visitor gets ready to start the match. Without ceremony Gilbert launches his first attack with a staff that has no sharp tip which is easily deflected by his opponent. The way Gilbert controlled his steps along with his polished movements impressed Nor. Nonetheless being honest with himself, he couldn't understand how this warrior could be so slow. Humble Nor considers that the royal knight might be going easy to avoid embarrassing the guest, so he asks for a moment to tell his opponent not to hold back so much. Upon hearing this, the lancer promises to raise the level of the duel. Gripping his lance more tightly, he charges at Nor and keeps his promise landing numerous blows with increased speed and precision, yet he still fails to hit his adversary. This time drops of sweat can be seen on Nor's face. However he notices that Gilbert leaves himself open when attacking as if provoking a counterattack. The member of the royal guard begins to get irritated by the fact that he keeps missing his target, but Nor continues to think that this is some kind of trap to catch him off guard. As time passes and the situation remains the same Gilbert loses more and more patience and increases his speed, while Nor keeps keeps asking for the level to be raised. Seeing the embarrassed reaction of his opponent, Nor realized that perhaps this really is the best the guy can do. Therefore he considers that all this solitary training he did might have had a greater effect than he ever imagined. Irritated Gilbert uses his first ability Dragon's Tomb to avoid the risk of leaving without having touched his rival. But when the smoke clears Nor had evaded the attack without any risk. Awkward about this, the visitor surrenders and leaves reflecting on what just happened. Happened. Meanwhile in the training room, those present wondered how that guy was able to escape the dragon's tomb. The soldiers made excuses blaming the blunt-tipped lance that Captain Gilbert used which hindered the ability's efficiency, but the officer himself knew exactly what had happened. From the first time he held a lance Gilbert discovered he had a talent for it. In no time practicing the young man was known throughout the royal capital as someone unbeatable, and as he trained and polished his techniques Gilbert grew stronger. Until until one day an elder from the village who followed the underground duels asked what the lancer thought of today's fight and he confessed it was tedious after all no opponent had been able to face him for some time and no matter how much he searched the boy couldn't find a worthy opponent. According to rumors the elder said that neighboring countries were moving to the capital in search of wealth and glory and that perhaps it was time for Gilbert to take a step forward in his career returning there to join the men who had that dream. Without hesitation Gilbert returned to the royal capital and practiced his technique by hunting demons. Hearing that formidable warriors had joined the army Gilbert challenged them all and defeated them one by one. However none of this was enough. In the end he still hadn't found a worthy challenger. Even in the face of the most terrible creatures in the region, every fiber of the lancer's body was moved only by the endless tedium of not seeing any being in front of him that could take his title of unbeatable. Over time this feeling turned into anger and and disdain for the weak who crossed his path. As time went on one day, his instructor approached him and commented that people had nicknamed him Sovereign Lance. According to Gilbert, it was just a silly nickname without disrespecting the teacher who was called Sovereign Sword.
sword. Seeing his pupils distress the swordsman suggested he face in his harness but Gilbert thought she wouldn't be a challenge. In fact he would love to duel someone like the instructor himself who must also be tired of training these soldiers who have the same strength he had when he was a clumsy kid. Anyway the teacher emphasized that his main mission is to protect the kingdom and prepare the men for it because a war cannot be won alone no matter how strong someone is. Besides surely one day someone will appear who will surpass him. Gilbert imagines it's possible and he hopes that person is more willing to duel against lower-ranked colleagues to rid him of his boredom. Returning to the present Gilbert saw in Nor the chance to see with his own eyes what a man who defeated a minotaur can do and how he behaves. But at the end of the day he noticed that the man acted strangely insisting he didn't want titles of glory or lands for himself despite doing what he did for the king, besides the discourteous way he treated the sovereign. Honestly Gilbert didn't see in that man someone capable of killing a demon of that level, but nothing could erase from his mind what he experienced in the duel against him. Reality will continue knocking at the door of his mind come what may, and this truth screams at every moment that Gilbert never touched his opponent during the fight. Near the end when the lancer saw in the dragon's tomb his chance not to leave there humiliated the adversary dodged the attack with the same ease. Thus for the first time in his life Gilbert felt defeated. To make matters worse nor gave up the fight to avoid embarrassing the cat captain in front of his subordinates and Gilbert knows this feeling will hurt him until it's resolved. Speaking of which as he raised his sword and withdrew nor confirmed that the two would meet again. As soon as the visitor left the officer noticed the cracks in the ring left by the man. Returning home nor analyzed that if he hadn't used his physical enhancement followed by feather steps he wouldn't have escaped that surreal attack. In fact he believes he would be dead if the opponent hadn't held back the strength of that blow. In Nor's mind Gilbert Gilbert was teaching him that pride leads to death, whatever the name of that night, was because up to that moment Nor still couldn't remember his name. Maybe it was Piupiu Belt or something like that. Whatever his name the Lancer showed the boy that he needed to train more and get even stronger. As promised, the next day, the adventurer used his royal gift to clean the cesspool as it fit like a glove. In fact, he left the cesspool very clean which for him was as great a merit as success after a long and arduous adventure. This efficiency made the boy famous in the neighborhood, so the the residents increased their demand for him to perform this service. However, even though he was happy that his cesspool cleaning job was going well it seemed that he needed to stay away from his other job for a while. After all, they were transporting soil in front of the dungeon where that minotaur originated so it was wise to be cautious even though he was only rank F and could take on few jobs. Now that he had more time the adventurer believed that this sword would be his partner in being useful to the people in some way. For example, he could use the weapon to row or to put the pizza in the oven. Who knows he might even use it to grill a barbecue for the crowd, nor would be a celebrity. The problem was that his fire technique was falling behind considering that his fingers still seemed like a human lighter. Even though he had practiced at several schools, all he could manage was to conjure low-level spells. In the midst of these thoughts Lin suddenly arrived and approached the adventurer. Remembering when Anis had scolded him for treating the king like a buddy, he addressed the princess in the most formal manner possible even though he looked like a Neanderthal in a suit. Lin immediately cut him off and asked to be called by her nickname, then informed him that Anis had told her where he was so she had come after him. With this, the boy realized that this knight had a knack for finding out where others were even though he had never told her where he was going. Then Lin asked to be the adventurer's squire, but he had no idea what that meant. She explained that it was someone who took care of another person's daily task while learning the techniques and knowledge from this master like an apprentice or assistant. Without a second thought Nor refused the proposal thinking he had nothing to teach the girl and that he didn't need her help for anything as he knew how to do everything himself. Lin argued that her family would pay him a generous instructor's salary but he didn't care about that. Not giving up the princess said she would do anything for the boy but he was serious when he said he saw no use for the girl. With that she almost cried while promising she was willing to 
do anything to prove she could be useful. Trying to make her point, she drew her wand and conjured a spell of ice lances. As soon as the lances fell, she summoned flames that melted the ice, leaving the simple cesspool cleaner frightened. According to her, this was her most promising ability, the Hellfire. Beside her, Lin also considered the mist blade quite powerful, as it cut an immense tree in half without the boy even noticing. According to her, her thief class instructor Karu was considered the Shadow Sovereign and had taught her this knowledge. But it didn't end there. Besides everything she had shown, Lin drew a luminous sword and performed the divine cut, which this time tore another tree vertically something even more impressive. Proudly, the princess explained that this was the most brutal technique of a swordsman. Despite all this, Nor kept saying no to the little girl. Curiously, he felt like garbage next to all the things the child had shown and didn't understand how she could see him as some kind of tutor. To show that he wasn't capable of much, he lit his finger lighter and said it was the only magic he knew how to conjure. Returning home, frustrated Lin reflected on how this kind of talentless warrior was just the type of legend the teachers told to encourage students. However, meeting Nor, she discovered this happens in real life. Remembering when Oaken taught her the small flame technique, the mage increased the fire and explained that even the weakest spells could become stronger if you practice them. Curiously, Lin began to practice this technique incessantly, but never managed to increase the flame. As ridiculous as it seemed, this magic required a lot of effort to develop which is why she was impressed when Nor reproduced this spell as the fire was bigger than Oaken's the greatest of the mages. At that moment Nor explained that this level was the same for the other five skill classes, which for him meant he was terrible, but Lin knew it was extraordinary. As extraordinary as the fact that Nor had fought a minotaur with a simple sword and never bragged about his strength to others. On the contrary, he helped the community humbly. For this reason Lin saw in Nor a strong man both physically and mentally, strong enough to live alone on his own terms. One day the princess would rule the kingdom alongside her brother and carry the clay royal family motto. Those with royal blood must be strong, and that was exactly what the girl aimed to achieve by being taught by Nor. With this in mind, she returned to the adventurer and declared that she would follow him wherever he went until he saw that she had traded her immaturity for usefulness. The next day, reflecting in his office, Lord Rain couldn't help but feel a twinge of envy towards Nor. After all, his father had given the black blade to that stranger who had just set foot in the castle for the first time. That was a rare sword found by the king in the deepest corner of the Dungeon of Doom alongside the six sovereigns. Made from an unknown material stronger than mithril orichalcum and mana metal no technique used had ever managed to scratch that relic hence it became known as the unbreakable blade. The big question that remained was how such a hard material became so distorted. Still despite its appearance, this artifact was worth more than gold and shouldn't be so easily discarded into the hands of a farmer. Yet thinking it over, Rain recalled that his father predicted tough times ahead and somehow saw in that man some kind of hope for facing the future conflict. It's not something conjured from his imagination, after all the guy had killed a minotaur and saved Princess Lin's life. With that in mind, it's possible Nor is some kind of secret weapon for the dark days that will engulf the clay kingdom. Speaking of Nor, he's at the market with Lin asking if it's okay for her to be seen on the street to which she confidently replies yes, because above all she's an adventurer. Feeling more at ease, Nor mentions he plans to stop by the guild after lunch and Lin thinks it's a great idea from her instructor. Being called an instructor makes the young man thoughtful as not even in his wildest dreams did he imagine he'd ever be considered someone's teacher. However, the more he tries to convince the girl otherwise, the more obsessed, she becomes to the point of following him around like a keychain. For this reason, Nor's idea is to go to the guild, pick up a menial low rank F job, and show the noble that he's just a simple man. After eating and arriving at the guild, the first question Nor hears is what on earth he's doing with Lady Lindbergh. Offended, the girl insists she's an adventurer named Lin, so there's no need to add titles to that. Embarrassed, the guild master nods, but still wants to know from the young man what's going on. Not even Nor 
Nor can explain so the old man apologizes for meddling where he wasn't invited. Changing the subject Nor asks for a job for two people expecting to weed a field or lay concrete under the sun. However the guild master knows the princess is a B rank so they can take on the task of hunting goblins around the capital. Shocked Nor knows well that these monsters are tough but the prospect of facing them gives the adventurer motivation and he starts to show excitement. At the same time he worries it might look like he's exploiting the girl's rank, especially since all he wanted until just a moment ago was to send her back home as quickly as possible. Seeing her mentor lost in thought Lin asks if everything's alright so he musters the courage to ask if she'd lower her rank a bit to join this mission. To his surprise, she's even more excited than he is about the job, especially if it means pleasing her teacher. Despite the relief, Nor also feels bad for depending on a girl her age to get this kind of mission. Nonetheless, it doesn't mean he'll give up on his dream because of it. So he grabs his sword and heads out for the adventure even though the guild master hadn't even mentioned the goblin's location. Seconds later, he realizes the mistake he made. Stamping the contract, the master asks the duo not to go too hard as even low-level monsters can pose great dangers. Pointing towards the beast forest, the old man indicates the mission's location and mentions that the right ear of the goblin will serve as proof of its completion. Rumors suggest these monsters have been dwindling in number lately, so if they don't find any the adventurers should bring back medicinal herbs or something similar to compensate. Soon they reach the capital's gate and the guard orders the gates to be open. Lin smiles as she feels her freedom in her hands and Nor expresses his enthusiasm for the first job outside the city gates. On the way the first thing the young man notices is that these trees are much denser than those in the south, something he had never seen before. Coming from nobility Lin had the chance to travel the world so she knows that each region's ecology varies. Seeing that the girl is not knowledgeable about these matters, Nor wants to know what kind of monsters goblins are. She explains that they hunt small animals and eat fruits, but are also known for their aggression towards humans out of survival instinct. If goblins are left unchecked, they will start reproducing to the point of causing food shortages in the forest and their high numbers indicate danger for the villages near the beast forest. That's why from time to time adventurers are sent to control their population growth. Moreover, it's said that a forest's ecological abundance depends on the existence of goblins, so they cannot be wiped out. For example, this forest has a variety of rare plants, not found elsewhere which is why novice adventurers are sent here to earn their first income. Impressed Nor realizes that this young woman is not only skilled with a sword, but also with her mind which intimidates the one who should be the tutor in their relationship. As they delve deeper into the forest signs of goblins had yet to be found at this point, which isn't normal. Apparently the rumors about the goblins population reduction are true. At least Lin feels the presence of a monster though it's a bit distant and that's enough for them to start the search in earnest. As Nor ventured deeper into the forest, she noticed that the woods took on an increasingly eerie appearance. Lin pointed out that this part of the forest was filled with old trees that cast dark shadows blocking out most of the sunlight. Despite the ominous atmosphere this area was a favorite haunt of goblins so their hopes of encountering one grew. However upon on reaching the spot where they expected to find the monster Lin saw nothing. But after looking around they spotted a goblin being half devoured by an invisible creature. In that moment Lin cast her revelation spell revealing an emperor goblin, a subspecies of the goblin king. Brimming with brute strength, the monster grabbed two tree trunks and roared with such force that it kicked up dust. Nor glanced at the princess and saw she was terrified. Despite her privileged abilities, she had no combat experience. To calm his pupil, he caught her attention and assured her that they would face this adversary together. Nor fully understood that this monster was worth ten normal goblins, but he didn't want to dwell on that or frighten the young woman, so they prepared for whatever might come. Analyzing their opponent, the princess noted that the emperor goblin was created by humans through genetic manipulation, a method that had been banned due to the dangers it posed. For example, this goblin could feed on its own kind to grow stronger. During this analysis, the monster attacked Nor with a tree trunk, which 
which he deflected using his parry skill, the adventurer's specialty. If attacking wasn't his strong suit, his defense was certainly formidable. By deflecting one of the blows, Nor managed to destabilize the goblin, giving Lin the chance to cast Wind Cutter. However, the enemy dodged, so she followed up with Ice Dance to cover a larger area and make evasion harder. But the creature used a trunk as a shield. After recovering, the goblin went back on the offensive, hurling the trunk at the princess who was protected by her tutor. The goblin repeated the same strategy while Nor comfortably responded with Perry keeping himself unharmed. When the monster paused briefly Lin noticed a monostone on its forehead and guessed it was the source of its power. But the enemy tested Nor's defense again, this time throwing multiple trunks at once a number he knew he couldn't deflect. Therefore Lady Lindbergh intervened with her wind blast repelling the trunks and striking a significant part of the forest. Despite being cut multiple times in the process, the Emperor Goblin quickly regenerated leaving Lin without ideas. At that moment, Nor took charge and asked the girl to aim the wind blast at his back. Nervous, she asked if she had heard correctly as that spell could devastate a fortress wall. But the man was confident in his strategy planning to use his sword to shield himself from the impact. In his mind, this was the only way to approach their opponent. With that Lindbergh cast the spell at her master's back, who used physical enhancement to avoid losing his legs in the process. With feathered feet he dodged the thrown trunks, and with light healing, he regenerated parts of his body suffering from Lin's spell. As he closed in on the beast, the adventurer leaped and struck the magic stone with his black blade dislodging the relic. After that the Emperor Goblin could no longer control itself flailing in agony and throwing anything in sight. Confident in their victory Nor asked Lin to finish the job but to do so without causing unnecessary suffering if possible. Understanding the message Lin cast Hellfire incinerating the monster. Despite the victory Nor felt guilty for having killed the goblin. He even planned to avoid future jobs involving hunting this species. Moreover, to prevent overconfidence and avoid unprepared danger, the warrior intended to retreat and train until he felt ready for greater challenges. Soon after spies from the Clay Kingdom informed Lord Rain that the novice adventurer had defeated an Emperor Goblin. The young noble could scarcely imagine how powerful such a creature must be with that monostone. According to rumors, it was ten times larger than a Goblin King. Since it wasn't normal to find such beings near the capital Rain suspected the magic empire was involved. Regarding the monostone, one of the prince's agents discovered it might be the demon heart from the sacred theocracy of Mithra. Considering even Lin emerged practically unscathed from the battle her brother was impressed with the quality she and Nor displayed even after being ambushed by an enormous invisible beast. Speaking of which Lady Lindbergh believed the goblin had been in the area for several days according to the spies. Fearing there might be more similar monsters around Lord Rain, ordered intense investigations in light of the new evidence. Returning to the adventurer's guild the master felt proud of the boy he had watched grow up capable of defeating a goblin. Humble as always nor credited Lin who tried to refuse the accolade. In truth there was no single protagonist in the battle and they both knew it as they exchanged a slight smile. It might not seem like much to other adventurers but today nor wanted to celebrate his first successful hunt. Meanwhile the master commented that even goblins could be troublesome as he had said to which Nor agreed especially with those mana stones on their foreheads. Hearing this, the old man asked if they were sure it was a goblin and requested the right ear as proof. From there you can imagine the adventurers exchanged another look, but this time with the expression of someone who arrives at a festival only to realize they forgot their ticket at home. After all in the heat of the moment they had turned the creature into a charred mess. Meanwhile Lord Rain receives a letter that he reads with apprehension. The manuscript contained the following words. At night a mysterious sound keeps me from sleeping. There are more stray cats and dogs now. Grandpa went for a walk and never returned. The nearby forest suddenly went quiet. For the past few days the cattle have been afraid of something and causing trouble because of it. The letter included the location where each of these events took place. Rain notices a connection between the manuscript and the incident in the forest of beasts and assumes that the enemy is more present in the kingdom than previously thought. Consequently, he orders his spies to form a group to investigate the indicated areas and urgently summons the six sovereigns. After his subordinates depart the prince is startled by how far the people of the magic empire will go to get what they want. With this unchecked ambition they will certainly take many innocent lives in the process of stealing the resources they desire. Meanwhile in a completely
completely different mood Nor and Lin are enjoying a barbecue relieved that they were at least rewarded in some way since they literally set fire to the evidence of their completed job. Fortunately for the pair the guild master is lenient to this extent. Aside from that Nor is still worried about the princess hovering around him all the time and wonders when she will return home as her royal family will soon be worried and searching for her. Speaking of which she informs him that she will return home immediately which lifts a weight off the adventurer's shoulders as he no longer needs to babysit the noblewoman for the day. However at that moment the princess's brother appears and summons Nor for a journey the next morning to a town in the kingdom's mountainous district where a guarded carriage will be the mode of transport. While Nor is left puzzled the lord regrets not being able to explain the details of the mission well, but assures the adventurer that he will be handsomely rewarded if he accepts the job. The next day Nor had accepted the mission through the guild, and the master advised the young man to relax and set off on the journey as the crown doesn't skimp on remuneration. But in truth, Nor didn't accept the offer for the money. Rather he had never ridden in a carriage before and wanted to see what it was like. For someone who never had the opportunity to hit the road this was the greatest reward for the young man who watched the landscapes around him with a smile on his face as the breeze caressed his cheeks indicating that his journey was about to begin. On the other hand Lin didn't seem as excited as her partner. In fact she felt guilty that her brother had burdened the adventurer with this mission but Nora assured her that he felt like a kid in a candy store plus he would be paid in the end. Before they departed Rain informed that the novice would travel northwest of the capital until reaching the mountainous district of Tauros. There he would stay for a while and if nothing abnormal happened Nor was to cross the mountain leading to the neighboring land, the sacred theocracy of Mithra. The inexperienced traveler questioned if it would be a smooth crossing and Rain believed it would be initially. The problem was that Lin was worried about it fearing something might happen. Inez Harness reassured the girl to stay calm as she was there precisely in case something did happen. The knight had received a secret order from the prince because according to him the royal capital would fall into an unprecedented crisis shortly. Therefore he ordered the squire to take his sister to Mithra in secret as Lady Lindbergh would not agree to stay there if she knew. Concerned Inez believed it was dangerous for her to be away from the capital in case of an emergency, but Lord Rain emphasized that this mission was of absolute priority as Inez was the only person Lin trusted completely. Later during a travel break the warrior apologized for Nor being involved in all this. With this additional behavior the adventurer began to think that this trip was not as innocent as it seemed especially considering how the two were acting throughout the journey. Inez tried to downplay the issue by saying that the responsibility of keeping the princess and the adventurer safe demanded great focus and that Nor shouldn't worry about her. In fact the man wasn't exactly worried as he knew how to escape a fight if necessary but the warrior made it clear that she had a shield and everything was under control. At no point had Nor seen the woman wielding such an armament so he commented on it with her. To his confusion she replied that it was even better that she didn't carry anything. Then she explained what she meant in practice by conjuring her divine shield through magic. As Nor touched the shield like a moth drawn to a flame, she asked him to protect himself behind this barrier if anything happened as almost no magic or weapon could penetrate it. In the meantime, Nor remembered when Inez mentioned that the officer who trained with him at the castle Gilbert had taken down a dragon alone. Thinking about it now, he was intrigued to know what this knight was capable of considering she was as powerful as the lancer. He praised the squire's talent, and this reminded her of her journey to get where she was. She discovered she had a mysterious power with in her shortly after arriving at the orphanage. However, one day a friend was curious about the green magic emanating from her hand, so she decided to touch that floating energy. As a result, the girl's finger bled and Inez was taken to the director because of it. Once there a cleric calmed the situation by stating that the injured girl had already been healed. Then he asked to see Inez's power and she showed that greenish energetic mass. Oaken who also served the orphanage believed that this magic was a gift from the heavens and that the bearer should choose between two options, transform this energy into a blade to cut her enemies or a shield capable of protecting those she loves. Regardless of the use this type of sorcery could annihilate an entire city according to the experienced mage. Faced with this Dandalg, the sovereign shield was responsible for training the prodigy girl 
who from a very young age trained incessantly to hone her skills. Despite being born with a gift that could literally save the nation from its enemies in ease couldn't avoid the fear of hurting someone again. With this trauma in her subconscious, the child didn't know how to deal with it and ended up distancing herself from others. After all these years of isolation Inez Harness met Noor during that unexpected visit and knew she had heard that name somewhere before. One day during her training phase the knight was so distracted that she was nearly killed by a giant praying mantis. Dandog was there to prevent a tragedy, but he seriously stated that the student could not afford such carelessness, for Inez Dandog was not just a special instructor but also a father figure. On that day the Sovereign Shield was alerted by a subordinate that a new swarm of insects was approaching from the west. In chaotic times like these Dandal confessed he would love it if Nor were still around. As time passed Inez's unresolved feelings developed and hardened her heart as she began to feel envy toward the man her master so highly esteemed. Dandal admired this Nor enough to wish for his presence in a war and the Sovereign Shield's pupil couldn't bear it. So when she met the young Nor this feeling worsened, but she swore an oath to become the Shield of the Clay Kingdom, and thus she couldn't be swayed by these personal issues. Her duty was to protect Lady Lindberg, and that's what Inez tried to do without getting involved in unresolved personal matters. Reflecting during the journey Nor observed the landscape carefully until he saw a path through the wheat field probably made by someone. When he realized what it was Lin ordered Inez to stop the carriage which she did. In the field all the wheat touched by that dark presence rotted immediately. In the face of the spreading black smoke Lin cast her magic to reveal the hidden being causing this devastation. Far away the royal capital was bombarded and surrounded by monstrous beasts. Rain ordered the infantry to block the roads to prevent the invaders from entering while the civilians were evacuated. Additionally the secret corps and the hunters corps had to act as quickly as possible to reinforce the resistance. The king imagined that Derida's the leader of the magical empire had come to fulfill his promise that the clay kingdom would eat its own words. The hope of avoiding the kingdom's end rested in the hands of the four sovereigns who were having trouble reaching the capital as each was forced to fight powerful monsters that appeared in their paths. Among them the sovereign shield led his men against king goblins that slaughtered the defensive lines. Similarly Keru the sovereign of shadows along with Oaken and the others resisted the surprise attack of enemy forces. At least Rain believed his sister was safe on her way to Mithra. However guiding a powerful winged creature that infested the wheat field with its virulent magic a young boy repeated endlessly that he needs to kill them all. When a magical shield around the two was broken the beast struck the boy violently with its tail. Observing the situation Inez deduced that this monster was the Black Death Dragon. Without thinking twice nor rushed with his sword to save the attack attacked boy. Before the dragon, the adventurer used Perry to keep his guard high and unyielding. Inez commented that the boy appeared along with the creature when Lin used her revelation spell meaning the child was a demonfolk. Some time ago Rain had explained to his sister the concept of demonfolk. They appeared to be human, but were semi-human with the ability to create a mental bond with monsters. According to records 200 years ago Mithril was practically wiped off the map by beings who controlled powerful beasts. After that humanity began hunting demonfolk incessantly and it was believed they had been exterminated. However Rain believed the descendants of this race were still around. If true the prince imagined these beings harbored hatred for humans for being hunted like rats. Regarding the black death dragon Inez knew this animal lived in swamps so perhaps the boy was dragging the beast to the royal capital. Probably the shock caused by the revelation spell broke the mental bond with the demonfolk causing the dragon to react violently. Even so the squire felt anger toward Nor for attacking without hearing what she had to say and she even prevented Lin from helping the instructor. On the front line Nor had no trouble holding off the monster and intended to keep it at bay until his two traveling companions arrived. However the dragon expelled a substance that if Nor moved aside would hit the child behind him directly. Considering this, the man deflected the attack with the black blade, but part of the viscous liquid hit him leaving him poisoned. Unable to react, Nor remembered that Inez wanted to say something before he charged at the enemy. Apparently she wanted to warn that it was a poisonous frog. Lin tried to save the teacher, but Inez blocked her with her shield because a 
a poisonous mist could emerge in the field at any moment and kill the princess within seconds. The potency of the frog's venom was so great that even Sane the sovereign healer would have serious trouble curing it. That said, the dragon expelled the mist around the field. Lin tried to purify the surroundings with a spell, but nothing was enough. Suddenly one of the dragon's fangs collided with the magical shield, and when the mist cleared Anise saw Nor still battling the monster. She then remembered when Dan Dog mentioned this adventurer's name realizing that Nor embodied the true mentality of a squire by sacrificing his life to protect others, and was not a mere fool acting on his own. In any case, after an intense battle the man fell to the ground already without strength to react. 